So welcome back. I hope you've enjoyed the morning. I hope you've enjoyed lunch. If you went to the session on media, that was great. And if you're still outside talking to employers, I suppose you're not in the room. So that's, uh, that's great. Um, as you've already heard, our guest today, I, Imakwadwe. No, that's not quite right. <laughs> Iga's fine. Uh, uh, is the founder and chairman of the Africa Initiative for Governments. Uh, which also has the same initials as his name, which is very convenient. A nonprofit institution established as a catalyst for high public sector performance in Africa. As you also heard, or at least if you listened carefully from one of the questioners, he's a supporter of the Blavatnik School. He's on the advisory board of the Blavatnik School and, and supports students there. He's the founder and, and chairman of Coronation Capital, uh, which we're going to hear more about, which is an African focused private equity and proprietary investment firm. Um, prior to that, he was the Group Managing Director and CEO of Axis Bank. Uh, he's a commander of the Order of Nigeria. Uh, he's won many awards, including the e &Y Entrepreneur of the Year. Um, he is on many boards. He's a, a force of nature in his country and beyond. Um, and so today's, I think, and we'll use the same rules as before. I'll go for about 20, 25 minutes, and then it's over to you for your questions. Um, and today, let's think about this as a, a play in three acts, or at least three acts so far. Uh, and the first act is really the Access Capital uh, Act. And you and I talked in advance about how it is that you created this firm and, and maybe telling a little bit of the story of that firm, if you could. Can you hear me? Yeah. Am I mic'd? Yeah. Uh, OK, fine. Thanks, uh, Dean Tufano. And um, I think I'll echo the remarks of all speakers with respect to the forum. Great turnout, uh, great energy in the room. Uh, but more specifically for me, Africa is home. Uh, Africa is my world. And Africa represents the world's greatest opportunity for change and impact. And so when I see institutions and individuals doing the right thing towards catalyzing resources and thought for Africa, I support it. So well done. Thank you. Now. Um, People describe me as um, a banker, some as an entrepreneur. Uh, you said force of nature. Uh, <laughs> Whatever you like. <laughs> um, but you know, it's interesting that I, I think that the history of individuals uh, has a profound effect on what they become. Uh, the reality of growing up and your circumstances influences you in one way or the other. Uh, so I'm, you know, as I've said, I'm, and I'm, I'm an African, and I was born in Nigeria. I went to school in Nigeria, all my school. I studied law. And uh, at the time that, you know, of my birth and schooling, we were trained as Africans or as Nigerians, actually, because there's a Nigerian way of thought, that the Nigerian could be as productive as effective and as important as any individual from any other part of the world in any chosen field of endeavor. And there is a lot of evidence of that. I was born to civil servants as parents. Uh, I grew up as a child of a civil servant. Um, and indeed, actually, growing up, and I think Hakim alluded to it, the best in Nigeria went to the civil service. As a child, that is what I understood about um, the talent pool uh, that was Nigeria, the best. It was very similar to what you found in, in Europe at the time. Um, and for reasons best known to the military, with the military's incursion, they decided to, um, in a sense, stop, to in stop investing in the civil service, in the public service. And for people like me, um, I saw the effect on great men and women who'd done great things, and this almost um, decimation of their relevance and their importance and their contributions to nation building. And I said I wasn't going to work for government. And immediately I started thinking, okay, what do I do? And I'm talking about I was in primary school at the time I made this decision. Uh, what do I do? And then the notion of, okay, fine, let's look at the private sector, what happens in the private sector. I said, okay, fine, I'll, go, I'll, I'll, I'll lead a multinational. And that's what led me to study law. So the multinationals that were doing well in Nigeria at the time were either oil companies or uh, fast-moving commercial good companies. And most of them picked lawyers if it was the uh, manufacturing or industrial companies as their CEOs. So I, I decided, okay, law is a good thing to, to use to get into, into, into these uh, hallowed boardrooms. 
uh, left school quite early, uh, went to law school. And whilst I was in law school, I had friends who'd gone into banking. And they told me about um, what it was like to work in a multinational merchant bank in Nigeria at the time. And I decided, okay, fine, you know what, let me make a switch. Let me try uh, uh, banking, or at least for youth corps. Youth corps is this compulsory one year uh, period of work you do after you graduate. So I got into what was Chase, and then my life changed. And this is the important thing about talent. Uh, very quickly, I was, youth corpers were not meant to do the kind of things that I found myself doing in Chase. So obviously, there's some talent spotting mechanism, and all of a sudden, you know, a youth corper is in the boardroom, a youth corper is in deals. And from that point in time, my life, until I went entrepreneurial, my life has been one where people look at my talent and basically uh, put me at things, okay? So uh, after Youth Corps, I was doing things at the age of 22 that most people did when they were 35, 40, okay? And because of that, I, no employer would allow me to go back for graduate school, okay? Just simple, it wasn't on the cards. You could go for training as long as you, you know, not, as long as it wasn't longer than, you know, one month, okay? And so I didn't have the opportunity to sit in a classroom like this and hone and improve uh, my skills in a certain way, okay? Um, but um, certainly my, my talent and my capital was developed, okay? Uh, and it was particularly honed in the context of a bank called GTB, Guarantee Trust Bank. And to put things into perspective, that was a startup organization. I joined it as a startup pioneer staff as a banker. And the bank has gone from what was then maybe um, maybe $2 million, no less than a million dollars of value today to about $3 billion of value. But this is over a 28-year period. Um, and very much so, I was part of the team that built the bank. Okay? And so then it gets into this you know, um, business school type of, of point in my life. Uh, so I was 32 or 30. Uh, you can argue what position I was in that bank, but understand that I was top four. Let's put it that way. Uh, already this was viewed as the best bank in Nigeria, if not the best bank in Sub-Saharan Africa. But I was very unhappy, extremely unhappy, and I didn't know why. Um, and I, I remember telling my, my mom that, look, listen, I'm, I'm really unhappy. And her, re her, her response was, yeah, you are mad. You are completely mad. You are, there's something wrong with you, you know. Uh, so anyway, you know, <laughs> I went to, so they allowed me to go for three months to Harvard for an exec uh, program. Uh, at the time, my, my brother-in-law, who has passed away uh, now, had just finished his MBA and was organizing a conference just like this. And I happened to be in the campus at the time this conference was organized, and this kid, looked at me and you know, he'd been talking to me and kind of, kind of understood where I was. And he gave me a book. The book is titled Buyout, written by Rick Rickerston, who had you know, an MBA from Harvard. And the book changed my life. Okay? So this notion of history defining you and, and, and so on. And basically, this, the, book, the book speaks to two types of entrepreneurs. There are two types of entrepreneurs, two types of people in this room. There are people who will do great things as part of teams in salaried employment. And there are people who do great things as owner managers or owners of teams, so to speak, or businesses where there are teams in them. So you are going to find yourself in either of those two journey paths. And it might be for profit, it might not be for not for profit, doesn't matter, okay? And I don't think there's any bragging rights either way. It's just for you to find your own, uh, your own self. So for me, I wanted to be an owner. And I resolved there and then when I read the book, I read the book in two hours. And I read it again, and I read it again, and I read it four times straight, back to back. Uh, and so I said, I'm coming back to Nigeria, I'm going to buy my own bank. Okay? So I was... You were 32? 32 at the time. And... Um, <laughs> and I kind of said, I said to myself, Again, this, this, you know, your, like I said, your history kind of defines you. So I'd worked in Guarantee Trust Bank, and I'd seen a tag team of two, 
two owner managers, I knew the power of it. But what was more important to me was that this bank was the beginning of something. It wasn't the end. So I was going to buy my own bank, but it wasn't about building my life around that bank. And so I said I wanted a partner, and I needed to search for the right partner. A partner who would, together with me and a larger team, basically change the way the financial services industry in Africa worked. That's what it was about. And that we would start with this bank, and it would go on and on. And I also felt that, look, listen, look, I'm, you know, I could die. Uh, and this wasn't about me. This was about this dream and this vision. And I wanted it to continue, irrespective of what happened to me. Uh, again, that notion of sustainability runs through everything that I do. Anyway, just cut a long story short. Um, we started trying to buy banks. Of course, we are trying to buy banks like Guarantee Trust Bank. Well, it was the best, but uh, maybe banks just one wrong below. Mm -hmm. And we found that it was kind of a bridge too far. It was either too expensive or, you know, and so on. So we just couldn't, you know. We were both worth $2 million, $2.5 million. So um, <laughs> we went to the opposite side of the, of the uh, ranking spectrum and said, you know, uh, you know, bottom of the barrel. And you know, the funny thing is the bank we bought was even below the rung that we were looking at. Uh, and it was called Access Bank. And the best way for me to describe the bank was that our $2 million plus $8 million of leverage bought us 52% of the bank. The bank had a foreign currency balance sheet that was less than, at the time, uh, Ali Kodangote's uh, credit card limit. Um, now, we bought the bank in 2002. Let me fast forward to now. I left the bank, running the bank in 2013, okay? So we are still the, we are still the shapers and the, the, the like influencers from an ownership standpoint of the bank. Herbert runs the bank. And um, I think with the, and we've grown in organic and inorganic fashion. So uh, with the last deal we were just closing, the bank would rank in Africa as the largest bank in terms of customers in Africa. Um, it would have about 20, 20 billion odd dollars in assets, uh, maybe $2 billion or thereabouts in capital. Um, so we haven't done badly in terms of operating that, that, that story. Not bad, as we say in Britain, yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> And then I, so that's Access Bank. Okay, before we leave Access Bank, okay. how do you turn a bottom performer into the bank that Access Bank has, has become? Now, I know that's a long story, but just what are the elements that turned it from kind of, we also t sometimes talk about, you know, a silk, uh, silk purse and a sow's ear. Um, you did that. So how did you do it? Okay, um, there are, first of all, it's about talent, you know, and um, you can have the right strategy, you can have the right resources, you can have the right everything. If you don't have the right talent, forget it, mm -hmm. okay? And by the way, you can have the right talent and nothing, okay, and every other thing will fall into place. So it's about the talent, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, fortunately, this was an area where we had uh, both domain expertise and, you know, local knowledge. So we, you know, the good thing about that story is that we were part of building GTB for 10 years. So um, it was a combination of, so we said to ourselves, what is the access bank person, okay? And we said it wasn't a GT person uh, because we wanted to grow and uh, 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 grow faster than GT, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, it had to be a mix of a GT person, a Citibank person, because our back office, we felt that the Citibank back office was the um, was the uh, was the world gold standard, mm -hmm. uh, and then we wanted a mixture of because the business the, the the value proposition to cons to customers was almost a consulting type of approach to banking, so we also wanted to be a top four you know McKinsey Bain type of so imagine creating a talent pool that represented all of this, mm -hmm. uh, which is what we did actually, and. Um, uh, very, very testing process, but very, very interesting, you know, uh, bonding, uh, you know, all the things that you, 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 you go through in building a team. Uh, but probably what is great is that 
those people, the access person, can be set to any task you can think of within or related to uh, that area of domain expertise, and they will excel in it anywhere in the world. So Access UK, for example, uh, because we, we, we started a bank in the UK 10 years ago, is the most successful challenger bank in the UK. So there seems to be a formula here. Access equals GTB plus City plus McKinsey. And the <laughs> next one, the next one is going to be even more audacious, which is BlackRock plus Credential. Why don't you explain the next equation? Because it's, uh, if you want exciting, the next stage is even more so. Okay, so um, the, the issue was like, this was never a story about a bank. This is a story about really, really changing the way financial services operates across Africa. And um, the one thing, you know, in the room, up to, well, I came, I came in at 11, so I'm not sure whether this discussion was uh, very heavy earlier on. But the one thing that um, is not done enough of in Africa is understanding the customer and understanding the pain that customers feel and providing solutions to that pain, whether from a private sector perspective or from a government perspective. Okay? And I think that is what is going to trigger the, um, this whole notion of Africa's potential and realizing that potential. Mm -hmm. okay? So um, at the short end okay, of life, if you look at, no, let me start from Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Okay. If you look at the development of the human being, all right, and what Maslow told us, he says, look, at the very base level, a human, a human being is, you know, needs some very basic things around shelter, mm -hmm. you know, and until those things are satisfied, forget it. The human being's thought process doesn't go beyond that. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when you, are, when you talk about, for example, you want, to, you want to change Africa, you want people to vote based on philosophy or whatever it is, the person hasn't eaten, so, you know, <laughs> you know so you, you get my point, right. okay? Yeah. So, so um, what is clear to me, all right, is that for Africa to pop, all right, for Africa to pop, for the private sector, for the world to truly enjoy Africa, we've got to lift the human beings. Okay? So when you look at this 1.2 billion and maybe in 20, 30, 40 years, it's going to be a 2 billion mm -hmm. market, do we want a 2 billion we are still thinking about you know, how to eat corn and so on, or do you want a 2 billion who have been lifted beyond that point okay, and are making choices around real value? I know what type of Africa I want. And so we realized that in terms of the solutions we provided as commercial retail bankers, which is around basically savings and a notion of transfer mm -hmm. of funds and, and, and loans. It's interesting, okay, but it's not going to lift us, okay? And until we start getting Africans to invest mm -hmm. and provide a real return on that investment, okay, um, we, will, we, will, we will move, but not very far. And one of the big reasons why Africans are not investing is that the financial services market has developed on the short end, okay? So great things have happened. M-Pesa, you know, you talk mm -hmm. about M-Pesa, sure. but look, listen, M-Pesa is not gonna develop Kenya. I'm telling you, you know, it's as simple as that, okay? Uh, to get Kenya developed, the capital markets have to develop, all right? And you have to mobilize savings into investments, not keep money on an M-Pesa phone wallet, mm -hmm. okay? Now, to do that, you need public sector institutions and intermediaries that have the capacity and the clout to, in the same way as, you know, I got into banking in, in Nigeria and we had two million bank accounts, okay? In Nigeria at the time, it was three million bank accounts and today you have 50 million bank accounts. We need to get 60 million pension accounts. Mm -hmm. We need to have mutual funds, just like you have in China, right? With hundreds of millions of Africans, mm -hmm. you know, on a T plus zero settlement basis. Do you get the point? Okay. What type of institution is going to do this? We spoke about um, private equity. And leave the private equity OECD model, private capital makes a lot of sense. And mobilizing private capital makes a lot of sense. You know, um, I told you about the Access Bank story. I, I never once 
had a conversation with a private equity player. And yet, we've mobilized more capital as Access Bank than probably the entirety of the private equity uh, 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 industry did at the time, okay? And if you think about people like Aliko Dangote, private equity is actually, frankly speaking, not relevant to the true growth stories of Africa today in the way it is offered and in the way it is. But I love the idea. I love the talent and skill that goes into private equity and it's relevant mm -hmm. if we do it the African way. And so we want to create a platform that takes all the domain expertise of private equity, of venture capital, of insurance, of asset management, okay? And we've decided to give the project Africa's BlackRock, that's the project title. We've been working on it for a while with McKinsey, mm -hmm. uh, even though now that we're recruiting, they're not happy, but I mean, um, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, the notion is that over the next 10 years, we create this model, okay, that allows investment management in Africa to work. And we don't want to be the only players. I mean, we want others to follow that model. We want, just like you have, uh, so you speak about uh, Equity Bank in Kenya and other banks and so on, mm -hmm. okay? So we'd love to have this, um, this model replicated across, across Africa. Um, to make it happen, okay, I need like 40 people from this room um, to join us. Uh, that was an offer, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and frankly speaking, uh, we're just looking for people who have the intellect, who have the innovative uh, thought process, and who have the intuition to operate in an African context. You know? But that's what we're doing now from, um, from uh, let's say, professional standpoint. So let's stick on African BlackRock or asset management version whatever for Africa. In asset management, as you know, there's lots of tensions between active and passive investing. Mm -hmm. uh, within active investing about different strategies, high frequency stuff in one part, long-term investing in another, um, investing with ESG concerns. Um, so since you're not bound by all the constraints of having the history of, of having created this organization before and you can start with pretty much a blank sheet of paper, how do you think about the asset management business going forward in Africa? Because the metaphor of Africa's BlackRock is, is great, but it may not be BlackRock. It may look very different than BlackRock. Okay, so first of all, why BlackRock? Simple technology, mm -hmm. okay? And uh, those guys have badass technology, all right? <laughs> um, and you see, technology in Africa is a transformational force that is much more relevant than it is in Europe, North America, and even Asia. Because the infrastructural constraints in Africa are huge. Mm -hmm. And the cost to overcome those constraints, to be honest, okay, uh, are beyond the capacity of uh, the capital available within the country. And frankly speaking, the capital outside the country that is ready to come. Okay? And what we found is that the, the most viable means of overcoming or leapfrogging this challenge has been in technology. Okay? Um, no, I don't think I should reveal that. Um, but but the, journey to, the journey from a typical African asset manager outside, in, well, frankly, I would include South Africa, okay? Uh, to a world-class asset manager operation, okay, today can be cut short from 10 years to 18 months using technology. Mm -hmm. Simple, it's, the, it's a fact, okay? So I can create for you uh, a world-class asset manager anywhere in Africa, okay, um, simply by having the technology infrastructure, all right, and then having people to operate the, the technology. Just so I understand, you're talking about the portfolio management side of the business or the non-portfolio management side of the business or both? All sides of the business, without the talent now. Okay. There's one thing to have the firm, mm -hmm. there's another thing to have people to operate the firm, okay? okay? So the technology bit was not easy to overcome, mm -hmm. but that's why I don't want to share, but there's some secret sauce there, mm -hmm. and fortune favors the, the, the brave, okay? 
So imagine me looking, just, just it goes something like this. So we're looking for, uh, we're looking for a team of the brightest technology people with domain expertise uh, and experience along the likes of creating BlackRock technology, mm -hmm. okay? So imagine this, we're debating this stuff with McKinsey, that, and then I get a, an email from a group of people who worked somewhere, uh, <laughs> who did it there, and who are looking to come to Africa. Mm. I mean, they didn't know, I mean, other than, you know, the introduction you gave of who I was, they didn't know what we were doing. So, you know, this is, this is a bit that people don't tell you about their great stories, that there's so much luck in it. So, but, you know, I thank God for that luck. Uh, so on the technology side, I think we're, we are, we're well on solving it. The challenge is, of course, talent, okay? Mm -hmm. And there are, when you're building out an enterprise, okay, there are two types of people you need. Both types must be smart. But you need people who have such a complete mastery of the subject matter, okay, that their contributions are going to be striking, okay, just based on that, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, but then there are certain roles where those contributions are not enough. So you need also people who have strong local knowledge, what I can call domain command and control, mm -hmm. okay? So their intuition and innovation in a local context is, is, is amazing, okay? So um, basically, we're looking for, our first 18 months, we're looking for 250 people. Of the 250 people, 100 are in the first uh, category, which basically is recruits from outside Nigeria, okay? Uh, and then 150 are local. Now, if we are successful, over the next five to seven years, we are going to need in total a thousand people. Same ratio, okay? So one of the things that we're doing or we're gonna to have to do uh, is for example, uh, for those who we are recruiting locally, okay, and they're smart, this, I mean, to work with me, you've, you've really done. I gathered that, yes. <laughs> so, so, we will, we will ha probably have to send, we probably have to send some like 20 people to schools like this every year from within our system, okay? Um, or more, okay? Um, and so those are for the local, okay? And obviously uh, get, you know, over the next uh, 18 months, um, 100 people who have a background of having an MBA from side school, that mm -hmm. type of thing. Um, now, this is fun. So every week I've been coming out here or going to New York and talking to people like you, and these conversations have been very, very interesting. Uh, but um, I think for the most part, uh, uh, people, uh, everybody has said yes. Uh, so it's very exciting. I'm, you know, I'm not doing this, no, correct this. I'm not doing this only to make money. Um, <laughs> but there is, there is a larger goal here, which is, you know, basically uh, providing transformational solutions to Africa's very unique challenges. So I want to take a few more minutes, but then go into audience questions. But this topic about public and private activity is really important. And so if we can touch on the Africa Initiative for Governance, what that's about, how does governance impact the private sector, what impact do you think you can have on the governance process? Um, maybe just a, a few words about that before we open it up to the audience. Okay, so I've told you about my background um, as a child of civil servants, okay? And I've known Africa when Africa worked, okay? And let me put things into context. Chino Achebe uh, has written, I think, he's the most publicized author in the world. So things fall apart, you've, you know, arrow of God, okay, fine. Do you know that this guy wrote five of those books as a civil servant in the Nigerian Broadcasting Corporation. So he was doing his job as a broadcaster and writing books that would change the world at the same time. I'm just speaking to the quality of talent that was in the civil service, okay? Um, and there are many more, okay? Many, many more, okay? And so um, it's no surprise then that the University of Ibadan, the first universities, the Broadcasting Corporation and so on, at 
in the early 60s, these were places where people came from all over the world, including, by the way, Lee Kuan Yew, okay, to understand what standards of running a country were all about. And um, the schools were good. Um, the policies around forming a country made sense, and we were on to a good thing. Uh, and then there were interruptions. In the interest of time, what is, what is obvious is that the correlation between economic development and the quality of governance is, I think, perfect. Okay? And from even a selfish standpoint, as a businessman, I have seen what has happened when you have the right policy context. So every example, not some, every example of a great economic opportunity that's pointed to anywhere in the world as Africa has behind it the right policy context. And behind that right po policy context is a public servant, elected or bureaucrat, okay, who's done a great thing. So the M-Pesa story is not a, contrary to what you think about, it's a private sector story. This is a story of a central banker okay, who, who had a vision of life beyond traditional uh, um, banking and who was ready to take risks to recreate and re-architect the way Kenya worked, okay? You then had a private sector that embraced it. The story of uh, telecoms in Nigeria, a country with 60, 70 million people and 400,000 phone lines, and we'd operated that way for 30, 40 years. It's the story of a president who says, I've gone across the world and I see this device called a mobile phone. Why don't we have it in the millions that you have across the world? And you, you put in place a civil, uh, you put in, you appoint a public servant, okay, and um, the, the rest is history. The story of pensions in Nigeria is similar, et cetera, et cetera. So my investment thesis actually is that in, in Africa, if you, if you can meet a well-developed public servant who knows how to traverse the issues of reform, you're going to make a lot of money, okay? Um, now, in my personal life, okay, I've had challenges, and in my business life, I've had challenges that almost took my life. So I've been flown out of Nigeria on, um, on an air ambulance, for example, okay, when people, my people, my, my people didn't know whether I was coming back. And guess what, this, what caused that? Um, I'm not going to mention the institution, but... On one side, you have a central bank with a revolutionary idea around consolidation. And on the other hand, you have an institution that's meant to enable this consolidation process and put so many obstacles in the way of consolidation, okay? And I remember I was, anyway, this, this, I was stressed to the point of, mm. you know, and it nearly took me, uh, nearly took others as well. Fortunately, we have a team, at, you know, and, and we went through it. Um, it's no surprise when no, if I mention, I was going to heap praise on somebody in this room, but you might guess the institution I was talking about, so I won't do that. Um, so, as far as I'm concerned, to change Africa, the private sector alone cannot do it. We need public sector partners, and we need capacity in the public sector mm -hmm. of, like Hakim said, of a level that is actually stronger and higher than we have in the private, in the private sector. And so... Um, scholarships, fellowships, uh, at the base level, uh, part of the reason why I, I, I try to make money is to um, make investments where countries are not investing, mm -hmm. African countries are not investing in public servants. It's not enough, okay, but I think it's a start. And it's significant enough to have gotten the Nigerian government actually to embark on a public sector reform process which was signed off you know, um, about a year and a half ago. But even in implementing that process, uh, there, are, there are challenges. So that's what it's all about. We want to put up in Nigeria uh, an institute of the quality of Brookings, uh, where civil servants in Nigeria will be trained out of their brains, okay? Much like you train, you know, uh, okay. yes. <laughs> and, um, uh, I think that as we do this, all right, others will begin to do the same. Um, but if we don't fix and address the 
human capital deficit in the public sector, we will be limiting Africa's opportunities and chances. That is a great transition. For those of you who are MBAs, when we talk about systems change here and systems leaders, this is what it's about. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to all of you. And who would like to start? Um, again, we'll try not to hurt anybody with the microphones, but um, maybe we'll start with this gentleman here. One, two, okay, thank you. Thank you so much. So just building on your last point, um, I, I work with the Commonwealth Secretariat and the, the daily pain, not pain, but the daily work is of course engaging with governments uh, almost all the time. And um, just wanted to find your perspective. There's a growing narrative, uh, an, an almost global north one around governments cannot create jobs. And, and, and this is, uh, again, exacerbated by a few things that you mentioned, how it comes down to that one public servant who is revolutionary in their thinking that then capitalizes you know, the talent, the, the policy and enabling environment and so on and so forth. So firstly, what's your take on that? And secondly, if we're going to sustain and grow the, the revolutionary uh, work that you're talking about here, capital markets and you know, boosting the domestic private sector and so on, what do you think needs to change without necessarily leaving that to that one leader who then gets to get in and, and come up with something different? Because we know with how politics are in Africa, again, the next 10, 15, 20 years have almost been you know, um, sabotaged because of the cycle of politics. And you know, I'm from Kenya and we probably know the next two, three presidents, whether we like it. No. <laughs> Whether we like it or not, be just because of the political. So how do we, you know, separate the dependence of the revolutionary, you know, policy context to not just be that leader, but then all the work that you've uh, been sharing? Thank okay, you. The, f the first question is, um, is quite straightforward. If you look, let me just take an example of Nigeria, okay? Um, work back um, 40 years. Government and government activities, government and government controlled activities, okay, probably accounted for, I would say, because of government's involvement in the private sector, et cetera, et cetera, probably accounted for 60% of GDP. And a, obviously, you can link that back to the job uh, uh, creation effect, because um, honestly speaking, if you're not earning uh, sustainable income or revenue, I don't know how you're going to pay workers. Um, and also, you look at the size of the uh, country from a population standpoint, et cetera, uh, the efforts of government in terms of job creation could be better felt. Today, the Nigerian government, government spending and government influence is less than 10% of the Nigerian economy. Okay? So whatever it is that a government tries to do, at most, okay, with 200 million people, if we even take, uh, just, you know, take a rough cut, right, at best it's going to be 10% 20, of those people. You get the point. Okay? Now, it's worse because this is now the, the age of the knowledge economy, okay? So even if you control whatever it is you control, um, you are very hard put as a government, okay, to uh, employ people so you can start it, okay? But very quickly, if you don't have the knowledge within that system employing those people, all right, you won't be able to sustain it, okay? And so... Um, and it's not even, you're not putting people down, I mean, people in government, it's just that the, the economic models that we have today are so market-oriented, so competitive, globally so, that it is impossible for government, which is not built to do that, okay, to be the creator of jobs. So that's, that's the notion, okay? And any government who wants to try should go ahead and, and do so, to be the, main, the mainstay of uh, job creation in any economy. It, doesn't, it won't work, okay? Now, in terms of your second question, I don't advocate for the, um, this messianic solution in terms of a leader, Lee Kuan Yew. But if you don't have an alternative, please, we, we, we pray for it, okay? Now, uh, but the, what did Lee Kuan Yew do? I visited uh, Singapore. Um, no, first of all, let me, let, me, let me trundle back. You remember I told you about that executive education program that I was on? And on that program, uh, was a guy in, in, my, in, my, in, my, in my group, was a guy in the Singaporean Air Force. And 
I said to him, what is a Singaporean Air Force guy doing on a program? Every, all of us here are investment bankers or you know, consultants and so on. What are you doing here? And he says, look, Singapore has been sending, I think, half, half of its talent pool to schools like this forever. Okay? I'm talking his government talent pool. Okay? So um, then why is it when it comes to systems thinking and project management and so on, you now begin to understand why the Singapore, uh, Singaporean Air Force is as effective as it, it tends to be. Okay? So the trick is um, have the leader maybe as a catalyst, and that leader transforms the public service by making sure there's huge investment required you know, and, you know, and, and it's done on a sustainable basis. Now, we're out of time technically. So what I'd like to propose is three quick questions um, that we'll collect across and then okay. close with those. So three questions. Um, let's see. Um, there's uh, one. Okay, one back there. Yeah. Yeah, you've got the mic, so why don't yeah. you start? Yeah, Baba Sundu Dunuga here. Um, my question is this. Um, where do we draw the line? Because for, I'll give an example. Can you lift the mic? I'll give an example of Lagos, for instance, where I come from. Uh, the government had a concession agreement, or what I call a PPP um, agreement with a technical firm. They built the Lekki Toll Gate, and it came to a point where they had to do this concession for like 20 years. So at what point do we now draw the line between government providing um, social amenities and services and the private sector trying to make money uh, from their investment? So where do we draw the line? Because okay. it came to a point, government had to buy back the concession agreement at the cost of um, several millions of um, uh, dollars or naira at the end of the day. So because private sector, the private company wanted to make profit and the people within the community said, no, we can't be paying tolls on a government road that should not be provided for free. So where do we now draw the line between the PPP agreements we have and, you know, uh, and, and whatever uh, government puts in place. Okay, so question one, question two. Uh, I'm not seeing any women. It's all men's hands up. Um, okay, uh, actually, oh, careful there. Somebody just got hit. Uh, there's a question right there. So about four rows down to your right. Oh, and I see one over here. You get the last word. Um, my question has to go this way. Due to private sector involvement in development in every country in Africa, is there any possibility for banks to roll out single digit loans for um, small businesses in order to sustain themselves? Okay. And question three then is over, over here. The last word. Oh, hi. Um, my name is Pamela. Um, first of all, thank you so much for like giving an insight as to what you've been doing to improve like the local community. Um, you mentioned earlier on that there's a need for more um, for for banks to invest um, in the capital rather than have them reserve. How do you get more local people as well as international? Um, countries to have more faith in the um, in the banking system of Africa and I must say like the regulations in e in the EU is so complex like super super complex I think gives everyone it drives everyone crazy do you think that Africa countries are looking to emulate that complexity of um, regulations that is in Africa and um, there's an EU um, there's in UK Europe and America in order to get that better confidence um, from investors. Okay, so you've got government private boundaries, you've got small business, and then you've got trust in banking. Okay. Um, the single digit loan question, I'll start there. Okay. I did notice something. It looks like, because um, earlier on when you've when you threw the box, everybody was catching it. I think people are getting a bit tired. <laughs> uh, and I, I draw an allusion to, ah, I, I'm a Man U fan, and I think uh, the PSG guy was a bit tired. <laughs> so so, so um, uh, I love it. Anyway, um, so 
your question is this. Uh, how do you get banks to lend at single digits when the government in those countries is borrowing at double digits? That's basically your question, okay? And um, it's a good question in the sense that if we don't solve that problem, okay, you are gonna have perennially this notion that um, the access to credit uh, is a real challenge. And up to this point in time, that problem, people have attempted to solve that problem, at least in Nigeria, okay, through some very crude and blunt monetary um, direct interventions, which are not sustainable, okay? And I think it's a capital market solution we're looking for. Now, you know that if you look at the structure, if you look at the deposit structure of African banks, okay, you will find that there is a disproportionate amount of deposits on the short end of, so it's either in savings demand, okay, or time deposits, okay? Um, and you also find that because of the nature of uh, those products, banks are able to pay you very little on those products, okay? All right. Now, um, most banks in Africa, okay, built themselves on a model where you have a, a large spread between the deposit rate and the lending rate, okay? To bring the lending rate down, interestingly, okay, you have to get the depositors or the savers earning a lot more money on their deposits. That's the irony. So if you, you, you buy a different type of product. So um, I don't think that banks can offer that product but I think that asset managers can offer that product, mm -hmm. okay? And what we will see, okay, is, which, is, which has happened significantly in more advanced markets, is that you will find that the huge gap between deposit rates, I know that the banks are gonna be unhappy with what I'm saying, but the countries are going to be happy with what I'm saying, I'm talking government. The huge gap needs to be disintermediated by asset management products. Products, and I'm not, I'm not sure it's going to be single digits, but basically what you want to have is a situation where because uh, uh, you have a direct relationship between the saver, or the, the investor, and the user of money, you bring down the spread. And to do that, you use technology. So peer-to-peer -peer lending in Africa is actually going to have a very different effect as it has had in, in, in Europe and America, I think. And basically what peer-to-peer -peer lending means is that if we create clearing situations where I can lend to you, and remember I was earning 3%, maybe 10% of my money, I can lend to you at 12%, um, 13%, do you understand, okay? Which is much lower than the 23 or 30% you are getting from the banking system. That is the beginning of this solution. Uh, and it's one of the products I think that we will be bringing to the market, but that's that. Now, to your, your wonderful question, and I guess it tells you why women um, are the solution to most of our problems. <laughs> they are smarter. <laughs> um, well, there were, there were, th there were, there were like uh, three, three questions there, but I, I think I'm going to paraphrase um, uh, them into, into this, uh, which is basically that what is it going to take to create a public-private sector solution that is enduring to Africa's development problems? And I'll tell you what it's going to take. It's going to take schools like this convening very, very powerful sessions, not necessarily here, but in Africa, okay, in combination with institutions like that which we are creating, where we put government and the private sector in the same room as vested parties. We lock ourselves in that room and say we must build the trust and ensure we have the right human ta capital and talent, okay, to dissect these issues and provide a solution. And quick example, 
if you go to Nigeria for the past two years, three years actually, you will find this funny thing where you drive on the bridges and you see trucks, lots of trucks, miles and miles of trucks, okay, on the bridges, permanently parked on the bridges, okay, and that's because they are queues to get into the port. So today you actually pay demurrage of about nine months to get your container out of the port just simply because you can't get your truck into the port. Now ask yourself, are you saying in Nigeria that we don't have the people who can find a solution mm -hmm. to this silly problem? Well, we're creating one of those across the European channel, but that's a different <laughs> matter. So. But, but there are so many problems that can be solved with the right convening and the right talent in the room and a will to, you know. So we have to do things differently. But we need to create the type of institutions and partnerships that allow us to do that. And I forgot the last question. <laughs> The line between the public one. and private. Oh, the line between public and private. Um, <laughs> this is going to be um, a very controversial answer. In the sense that with, with globalization, with technology, with this thing called social media, I'm not too sure where that line is anymore. Mm -hmm. A businessman has taken over the political economy of the US, <laughs> okay? With very little infrastructure, very little capacity, very little history, okay? And is influencing public policy in a way nobody has in a long time, okay? I don't know if you know where I'm going with this. So, I'm not too sure whether we should focus on that line or whether we should focus on what the output is. Is it for good? Is it sustainable? Is it in the interest of the greater numbers? And maybe concentrate on that and spend less time worrying where it's coming from because I don't think we have that power anymore. Um, social media has weaponized ideology and doctrine in ways that we don't have control anymore. Mm -hmm. And what is government is, is, is debatable. Two things on, my, on the last note. Every time I spoke in Oxford, very strange things happened thereafter. <laughs> um, so I, I, I spoke at a session, and this was one week before Brexit, and nine of us said, the Brexit vote was going to go one way. One predicted the right way it would go. And for, I mean, I still, I still, uh, I hadn't gotten over it when I was on a plane. I got on that plane um, believing that when I landed, I would be seeing Hillary Clinton uh, announced as the winner of, and I got, and we landed, and I couldn't understand what I was seeing on my phone. Mm. <laughs> Okay, and I was flying from here, by the way. Okay, now it's not about Oxford predicting wrongly, but <laughs> but it's just more about um, my belief that at this point in time, it's more about me understanding what the world wants as opposed to thinking that I can dictate or 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 or, or, or force it. That's a great close. Can I just summarize so much that you've talked about? Power of ideas. A book changed your life. Uh, putting customers first changed your bank. Uh, technology and talent both have to be equally strong in order to succeed. Taking on big, bold challenges like creating Africa's BlackRock is within scope. Strong business and strong government both have to succeed in order for, for things to work. And I think in your last comment, putting purpose first seems pretty important. Is that a fair summary? Yeah, the dean, yes. <laughs> <laughs>